but it's been a while now since I've done a video where I answer some of your questions all around blogging, affiliate marketing and building an online income. So that's what I thought we'd cover in today's video. So I'm going to answer as many questions as I can, but I might not pronounce all your names correctly. So I do apologize if I mispronounce your name or don't even attempt to pronounce it at all. So let's get into this. So first of all, thank you for submitting all your questions on my community tab on my YouTube channel. We had over 35 questions asked. A lot of them was kind of repeated or very similar topics. So I've narrowed it down to 21 blogging questions that we're going to answer in this video. I do want to keep it as short as possible. Nobody wants to watch an hour long video from me. So we're going to rapid fire answer these questions. Now, if I missed any, you can also go over to my Discord group. The link is in the description below where I will directly answer any questions that you submit to me. We also have a really helpful bunch in there. There's 495 people, I believe, in there and some are real authorities within the industry. And some of those people will also help you out. So if I don't get to answer your question, Maybe one of those guys will help you out as well. So again, the link is in the description below. So the first question we have is from Cook Food. And you ask, how much traffic can you expect in a year after publishing 250 articles with a thousand word count each? Well, unfortunately, that's really difficult for me to say. It would all depend on the type of keyword you're going after, the strength of the competition, the quality of your writing, etc. There's so many variables. It's kind of like saying, how long is a piece of string? It is just impossible to answer, but I can give you some numbers to work from. I have a website that's 12 months old now, and that gets around 15,000 page views per month. And it has about 200 articles. So if you've got 250 articles, ideally you should be getting around 25,000 page views per month. But to add some context to that, a friend of mine has launched a website 12 months ago and he's getting 70,000 page views. So it's very difficult to give you an exact number on that. And the next question we have is, how reliable is passive income from niche websites in your view? I've gotten $2,000 a month from my site, but I feel it could be fragile and disappear with an algorithm at any time, or a competitor could drag my traffic down within a few months. Am I paranoid? Well, that is a great question. And no, you are not paranoid. I feel very similar. I do feel at the moment, unless you have a really authoritative website that's got years under its belt, then all websites are vulnerable, whether it be from Google updates or whether it be from competition. Like I say, unless you have been around for a long time and got some incredible backlinks and got some really good domain authority, your website is unfortunately at risk. Just like any business would be from competition or changes in the marketplace, there is vulnerability in all businesses. Now, that is no different whether it be online or bricks and mortar. You could have a shoe shop in the high street and somebody could open a shoe shop two doors away from you. It's just the nature of being in business and there's no way of avoiding it. The only thing you could do is focus on what you're in control of and that's growing your website, adding content, growing the authority and making it as powerful as possible in case any competition comes along or any algorithm updates come along and that way you're not affected too much. But yeah, there's nothing you can do about it, and you are right to feel paranoid, but it is a risk in this business. And the next question we have is, in your opinion, what's better for a general sports website? Talk about each sport and write 30 to 40 articles about each sport and cover each sport completely, or seven or eight low competition articles per sport. So I picked up a couple of things in this question. You said general sports website. So it sounds to me like you've already decided that it's not going to be a narrowed down sport niche like golf in particular. It's going to be a general sports website. If that's the case, then number one, you need to go after as many low competition keywords as possible. And then after a length of time where you've got some traffic to your site, you could start seeing what's working best for you. Google will pick up on a certain topic and that way you can then force your attention onto that one particular sport topic. So you may have football, cricket, rugby, then maybe tennis might take off. So that's maybe where I would then focus and get as much content on as tennis uh, as I could. 
do the best you can generally with low competition keywords and then see how the traffic plays out and that's what would decide for me whether to go for one particular topic in a sports category or keep going generally overall. I'd get that information from my analytics and work from there. And the next question we have is, how does the process of knee selection differ if the end goal is display ad monetization as opposed to affiliate commissions? Or does it differ at all? So for me, it 100% differs. If you are going for commissions, that sounds to me like it's gonna be a very product focused website. In which case, do you want display ads to be your main priority and source of income? Wouldn't that not be from your products? Often adding too many ads on a product page can affect the amount of sales you get. Whereas if your primary goal is monetization through display ads, then why wouldn't you choose really easy topics and really easy niches? Niches where there is a ton of information questions to be answered. You'll find they're easier to rank, they're easier to find, there's far more of them, and display ads suit information content better, in my opinion. So if you're gonna choose between affiliate commissions and display ads, then you're really deciding between informational content and product-based websites. In my opinion, that's what it sounds like you have that decision with. And for me, hands down, information works better all day long. Products are so hard to rank at the moment, unless you can buy the products and write the most amazing, unique content ever, then I'd stick with informational posts, niches that have got a lot of informational content, and then you can monetize with display ads. And the next question we have is from Calm Music 30 Minute. And you ask, if I could cover almost every topic in one pet breed and then switch to the second breed and so on, the only breed name would change, but the general question would stay the same for every breed. Would that be considered as keyword cannibalization? So I think you are talking about, let's say you want to cover a lifespan of a pet. So it would be, what's the lifespan of an Alsatian dog? What's the lifespan of a poodle dog? And all you're doing is talking about changing that species name. Well, if that's the case, then that would not be cannibalization, in my opinion. Now, I'm not the world's expert on cannibalization of keywords. It's something I am learning about each day. And I don't think that it would be cannibalization. Now, however, if you were doing an article where it was, let's say, how to breed Alsatian puppies, and you wrote a really in-depth article on that uh, process, and then you wrote another article that was, uh, is it easy to breed Alsatian puppies? And then you wrote an article, Breeding Alsatian Puppies Guide. And then you did Beginner's Guide to Breeding Alsatian Puppies. All those are conflicting with the one keyword. So that would be classed as keyword cannibalization. But if you're writing about different breeds, different species, then it's totally different. Google will understand that an article on lifespan of an Alsatian dog and lifespan of a poodle dog are not related at all and therefore should not be cannibalization. And the next question we have is, how do you balance full-time blogging, time and family? How much do you actually pay yourself? And what are the things you've really felt has helped you reach your goals so far? So kind of a three-point question here. So let's tackle the first part, blogging and family life. As I am now a full-time blogger, it is much easier. When I first started out, I was working a full-time job and I was writing articles and blogging in the evening or before I went to work. Now, that was very difficult. There was literally no family time. It was hard work and dedication that got me through that. But I said to my family, I know it's going to be two or three years of hard work, but at the end of it, when I do become full-time, it will be much easier. And that has been exactly the case. Uh, if I want to take tomorrow off and take the children out to the park, I can do. My income won't drop, nothing will really be affected. So you need to get to the point where you have enough stability in your income and your business to be able to spend more time with your friends and family. And that's the whole idea of doing online affiliate marketing and blogging, that you do get that income in that is semi-passive and that can afford you some freedom to spend more time with your friends and family. And the second part of that question is how much do you pay yourself? Well, I am full time, I am also a limited company. So the best way for me to be as a limited company is to take a very small wage each month, but then my salary is topped up by taking dividends. It's the most tax efficient way here in the UK 
of taking your earnings out of the business. I still have to do pay my taxes, my corporate tax and income tax. I still have to pay those, but I pay myself the smallest amount of wage possible, which just covers my bills. And that way it's the most tax efficient way of doing it. And the rest of the money is left inside the business to grow the business. Now, if you want me to put a figure on it, at the minute I take out around $2,000. Now that covers all my mortgage, my food bills, etc., but still leaves money in the business to expand it and grow it. But don't get me wrong, there's money in the bank from the business. So if I did want to take a big dividend, let's say I wanted a, a vacation or a holiday and I wanted to take $5,000 out of the bank account, I could do, but I would have to take it out as a dividend. So I pay myself the lowest amount of salary possible, but then take higher dividends. And the last part of your question is, what has helped me achieve my goals? I think it's just determination. I think it's just all those days where I didn't want to write, just pushing through, just doing it and saying to myself, I have to do these three things today. I must get that one thing done. I did put a lot of pressure on myself, but I think it was that determination, that drive to push through. And also the thought of if that person can do it, I can do it. If he can do it, she can do it, I can do it. And that's what kind of drove me on. And it still is today. If I see somebody doing really successful I always have the mindset of, I can do that, or I can have a go at doing that. Might not always work, it might sometimes fail, but I always have that mentality to just give it a try. If you don't try, you're never going to know, you're never going to do anything. So yeah, I think that's what's helped me to get where I am today, just that relentless strive to push forward and keep doing it. And the next question is from Diabetic Game Guy, and you asked two questions. The first one is, did you have imposter syndrome when you first started creating your videos? I'm concerned what people will think of my videos and they'll say, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? And the second question is, was it mentally tough when you first started creating videos? And did you get a lot of trolls and mean comments? So to answer the first part of that, uh, imposter syndrome still happens to me daily. Uh, many times I've sat down in front of this camera, started talking and just after half an hour of trying just given up and thinking this, this is crazy who am I talking about this why, why does anybody want to listen to what I have to say so imposter syndrome is 100% real and it happens to all youtubers I don't care what they say it happens to the best of them but the way you get by that is just by trying it just uploading and seeing what happens and hopefully the comments are good hopefully YouTube likes you and starts pushing your videos out and you grow and gain in confidence from that and that's what's really helped me. And the second part of your question, have I been trolled or get called mean things? Yeah, I have. I've had a few trolls on my site. I've had a few arguments within YouTube with people that disagree with what I've said. And you just have to, if they're really mean and cruel, just delete them, ban them from your channel. You don't want that negativity on your channel. And if it's just a point that somebody's made, then talk about it. Everybody has the right to say, you're wrong, Carl. Uh, and I have the right to say, well, this is my opinion. That's what YouTube is about, kind of freedom of speech. And if you don't like it, fine, comment below. We can have that conversation. And if I'm wrong, I'm always the person to hold my hand up and say, you're right, I got that wrong. And the next question we have is from a regular on the channel, Devon Pig, and you ask. And the next question we have is from Devon Pig, who's a regular on the channel, and you ask. Why do the major publishers use those spammy clickbait adverts at the bottom of their pages? They use them all the time, they look so trashy. Who is the ad platform? Well, I know exactly the ones you're on about. The ones right at the bottom, they usually come in a box of six or nine adverts. They can be really random. They can often be really rude images and clickbait titles and clickbait images. And I think it's called Outbrain. If I'm not wrong, I'm sure it's called Outbrain. When I had my first website, everythingmontypython.com, I did add them at the bottom of the pages just to see and they don't get clicks or they didn't for me. They're really spammy and trashy looking, but they do pay really, really well. So these sites that are celebrity gossip and news and that kind of channels, I can imagine they do get clicked in that because people are there for the latest gossip and the latest news. Whether it be real or fake, they don't care. They just want to read something interesting. But to have them on a general informational website is a no-no. They look horrible. I'm 100% with you, they look trashy, and I don't know why these channels do it other than the money.
And the next question we have is from Ashwin Joy. And Ashwin asks, do you use Ezoic video ads? Any tips on increasing the website revenue using video ads? So I don't use video ads on any of my sites with Ezoic at the moment. Uh, they're fairly newish sites and I've just not got around to adding them. I do, however, have video ads with one of my websites on Mediavine. And I'll put a screenshot up now. It is quite a decent part or proportion of my income from there. And it doesn't affect the user experience at all. It's a very small video that appears at the bottom of the screen. And it's a simple click and the user can get rid of it. But the more and more you target those videos at the right audience, the more the revenue will increase. So let's say you've got a website and it's all about cooking and you've made a blog post about strawberry cheesecake then it'd be ideal to make a video showing you making that strawberry cheesecake and have that displayed on that one article. Now, if you would display that one video on a different article, let's say maybe for a chocolate cake, it's not going to get as many clicks, it's not going to be as relevant and the RPM will not be as high. So if you can make a video about every topic you write about, you're going to earn substantial money from videos. If not, then what I've done on my pet website is I've made four or five general videos relating to each pet. So I might have one video about rabbits, I might have one video about guinea pigs, and that will guinea pig video only shows up on guinea pig articles, and the same with all the other ones. And that is enough to get me a reasonable income from video ads. So that would be my suggestion, make videos related to the post that you're going to show the video on. And the next question we have is, can a new domain get up to 80,000 traffic monthly in one year if you work hard? And the answer to that is yes. You could get 20,000 page views, you could get 200,000 page views, or you could get your 80,000 page views. It just depends on the content, the niche, the quality of the content, the authority of the website, the authority of the domain. There are various factors that could affect you getting to your 80,000 page views. But with hard work and determination, I'm sure you can do it. And the next question we have is from a fellow YouTuber, Tortoise Cashflow. And you ask, I'd like to know more about your plans for keyword care business. How do you plan to grow it, scale it? Will you outsource, raise a price, or not scale it, or eventually stop doing it? Well, do you know that's a really good question and one I'm trying to figure out myself. My initial plans at the moment for keyword care is to revamp the website and the way the actual process works, and, and we're working on that at the moment. So when somebody orders a keyword, package from me. I want the process and the actual experience of doing that to be a lot easier. I want to put some videos on there so people know what they're buying and what they're going to expect to receive. And as far as growing the business and scaling it, I am training two colleagues at the minute, two people that work for me to actually help me try and do the keyword research. Now, they're getting really, really good at it. In fact, they're, some of their information and keywords that they're coming up with are as good as mine, if not better. So there is a chance of scaling the business and, and I would have to do that because at the moment I do pretty much a lot of the work myself and it's very, very time consuming. I can only do about 15 to 20 orders a, a month maximum at the minute without some help. So that if I could train somebody else to do it, where maybe we could get up to 40 orders a month, then maybe 60 orders a month. But for the business itself, I am not sure where to go with it. If I could sell the business, I probably would do but the business is kind of me. It's kind of my research, my business. Although the authority of the actual domain itself and the actual service, the reputation the service has got is growing. So maybe if I do sell the site, somebody can continue to do exactly what I'm doing now. I'll be honest with you, I never got into this business to be a service because that's exactly what I wanted to get out of that being tied down and you know bound by restrictions of working for other people, which is essentially what you are doing if you're offering a service. And that judgment on it, whether your work's good enough, I don't really like that side of it, but the service helps new websites. I, I love to hear when people say, wow, those keywords you found me really helped me get to number one or it's really brought some traffic into my site. I love that and that's why I do it. And it also is quite financially rewarding. You'll see from my income reports, it is a majority of my income. So I do need to continue it for the income, but if I can find a better way of doing it or eventually selling the business, yeah, I'd be certainly open to offers. And the next question is from Saeed, and you ask, here's a tricky but very important one. What's the best strategy to create zero to $1.5 million in 12 months? Um, 
I'm not sure. If you know the answer to that, then please let me know. To get from zero to, I think you mean, I'm hoping you mean $1,500. If you do, then just create original, good quality content, informational base that people are searching for. That's the answer. If, however, you mean 1.5 million, buy a lottery ticket, I think that's the only way you'll get to one and a half million in 12 months. And next question, very similar to a few we've had tonight, there seems to be a theme on this, and how much traffic can we expect if we publish 450 articles in a year and 200 articles being in the first three months? And again, I'm gonna have to kind of stop answering these questions because it's impossible for me to say 450 articles in a year is an incredible amount of content but it could get you anywhere again from 10,000 visitors to half a million visitors. Who knows? It is really difficult to um, say. My only suggestion would be stop worrying about what it would bring and just actually do it and find out. If you're worried about, you know, if I do this, will it do that? If I do this, will it do that? You'll never do it. Publish those 450 articles and let's see. As long as you're not outsourcing the entire 450 articles, which is going to cost you probably $30,000, then it's no risk if you're writing those articles. But again, to write 450 articles in a year is going to be a push. But just take action rather than worrying about the what ifs. That's all I can suggest. And next question is a really good one. Do you use a pen name on your website? What was your experience of it and what do you suggest for others? So on my main website, carlbrabber.com and also hutchandcage.com, I did put my own name on those and I'm happy to be kind of related to those. The only time I don't use my real name is on my smaller websites where they're in a different niche or a different topic because I don't want Google to see, wait a minute, Carl Brobert does blogging, he does pets, he does camping, he does fishing, he, whoa, he does a lot and it's going to not build up uh, an authority on my name around that topic. So I suggest if there's one topic you're really interested in, put your name to it, be the authority in that topic. Then your other projects, yeah, I would create a, an alias or a pen name and make sure you do all the usual things like try and give the uh, pen name some authority and build a social media profile and even get them their own email and try and create it as if it was in a real person with authority in that topic. And the next question is from WP Guider, and you ask, does silo structure an effective way to rank in 2021? So the best way to say what a silo structure can do for you is to say that it will guide and make it very clear for Google which pages you want to rank. So which pages are within a specific topic or category, and that way, with them all linking to each other, it makes it easier for Google to come and crawl your website and find all your relevant information. If you structure your silos correctly, what they should do is point a lot of the authority to either one main page or one topic. And that way you can really command and control that topic and hopefully be the authority or show Google that you are an authority in that particular topic or keyword. So that's the whole idea of a silo structure, just to neatly organize it all so Google can easily find it and rank it. And the next question we have is from Mom Van Up. And you ask, how to develop an interlink strategy, also mindset for working from home full time with a family? So again, a two part question, interlinking, basically interlink to articles that make sense. If you've got an article about breeding dogs, why would you link that to an article about breeding cats? It just has no relevancy. So make sure your internal linking structure, again, makes it easy for Google to crawl all your relevant content, but also makes sense. Linking externally, I link to authoritative websites. So any white papers that's been written, any studies that's been done within that category or that keyword or that article, then it makes sense to link externally to those. I don't externally link to really low authority websites unless their articles are really good and they're just maybe not being picked up by Google, but maybe they've got a fantastic piece of content on there. And then it would make sense to link to them. So as far as family life and working, just be organized and structured. Today, I have a list of about 20 things to do. And so far, I've done two of them on that list. But I'm not too worried because I set myself a target of doing three things. So I have a list of 20, but I said to myself, these three things have to be done today because they will drive my business forward. 
They're kind of the must-dos. And then the other 17 on my list are could-dos or want-to-dos. But make sure you wake up each morning with a clear intent of what you need to do to push your business forward. And then the rest of it is just a bonus. And the next question we have is, I remember in November's Q&A, you said you usually don't make backlinks and just let them come naturally. Did I hear that right? Can you please explain how you make backlinks? So yet yeah, you are correct. I don't usually advise building backlinks, not particularly if it's a general informational blog or website. I only suggest building backlinks if your niche is very competitive. So my high ticket item website is very, very competitive because it's going after products that are $2,000, that kind of range. So everybody's going after those products. So I will need to build backlinks to a website like that because there's no chance on earth I'm going to rank any of that content in the top three spots without having a strong backlinking profile to that website. It's just not going to happen. So on a website like that, I outsource my links. I use Stan Ventures because they're effective, simple, topic relevant backlinks. And that's really all you can ask for if you're outsourcing it. So if you want to try that out, the link is in the description below. It is an affiliate link to Stan Ventures and it'll take you over to my landing page. And the next question we have is from Infinite Dreams. And this is probably the best question without far this month. And it is, would you rather have hands for feet or feet for hands? Right, this didn't take me long at all because I hate feet. So I would, oh, worst nightmare to have feet for hands. So I would definitely suggest I would have hands for feet. And the next question is, is failure possible if a domain is not penalized constantly producing great content, has a very low competitive niche, and a manager that is a bit experienced. So is failure still possible? And yes, even the best affiliate marketers fail. Some of my websites have not done very well. I don't know if you could class them all as failures, but I've certainly had some that, yeah, didn't do as well as expected, no matter how good the content is, no Google penalties, nothing shady on the backlinks or anything like that. And it just doesn't work, whether it's the content, whether it's Google not showing you any love, it is possible. It's the nature of the business we're in. Sometimes you can do very little work and hit great success. Sometimes you can put your heart and soul and passion into a project and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't take off. So yes, failure is possible. But like you say, if you've got good content, very low niche, a good content manager or somebody working on your website, the chances of you having success are greatly improved. And the next question is, I have failed two times, but my new blog, which is in the Mexican food niche, I have 20 self-written posts, 1,500 words in five weeks. If I keep going at the same speed, how much traffic can I expect in 12 months? So again, a very difficult question to actually answer. But if you're publishing 20 pieces of content in five weeks, then just continue to do that. It means at the end of 12 months, you're going to have a website with hundreds of pieces of content on. And that can only be a positive thing. Now, don't rush to get the content out if it means that you're writing or producing inferior content. Particularly in the food niche, I would say that you need to produce a really good article. You need to make a video about that recipe. You might want to make a Pinterest account and have plenty of pins for that. You might want to social share it. Certainly within the food niche, there is more you can do other than just writing blog content. If you're in the cooking food niche and you just decide to just drop 300 articles on a website, it might fail. It really needs that catchy, unique selling point. Whether that be you making the recipe or you showing a tutorial how to do it or really catchy images on Pinterest, you will need to have some sort of unique selling point. Or it is possible you can have really good success, but it is a very competitive niche you're going into. And the last question we have is, how many unique keywords do you use per post? Now, this is a really interesting question. Whether you go for keywords in your article or whether you go for topics. Now, I actually go for topics more than keywords. Granted, you need to find the keyword to find the topic, if that kind of makes sense. And the keywords are relevant. But Google is smart enough now to know that a keyword can rank for various keywords. So whether you was targeting the word ground nut or peanut, it's kind of irrelevant because Google will understand which is which. And what will happen is it will rank for the topic of nuts in general. So um, topic to me is more important than keywords. 
Although, like I say, to find those topics, you often need to find the keywords. So there we go. I hope you enjoyed that Q&A. I will put a link up to the last Q&A I did. It was some time ago now, but I'll leave a link on the screen here. It'll be a suggested video that you can click and watch. If I've not answered any of your questions, remember, you can head over to my Discord group where I'm happy to answer any more questions that you have. But for now, thanks for joining me and I'll see you in the next video.